This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to our transcript series of Spring 2012 events. At Military History Night on February the 15th, Canadian historical writer Peter Piggott spoke on the topic From Far and Wide, The Complete History of Canadian Arctic Sovereignty. May I say that as an author, my book is for sale at the door. Um, it goes to a charity very close to my heart, mainly taking my two daughters to Cuba on Saturday. Uh, it's the, um, I know you're surprised. The, um, my two daughters haven't tasted Cuba Libre in mojitos. And um, yeah, I blame the McGinty government and the educational cuts for this. But... Uh, uh, any books you buy will be in a good cause. Uh, they sell uh, chapters on Amazon for $35. I'll make them to you for $25, uh, and they're signed as well. So on your way out, please. Well, um, I'd like to introduce myself. Pat is very kind. I've spoken uh, in this room before, and uh, I knew I'd be back because the last time I spoke... Uh, Pat said it'll be a cold day before he's invited back, <laughs> and obviously here I am. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming out tonight. Very, very kind of you. The uh, Arctic sovereignty is a um, topic that is on everyone's mind these days, and it's the history of the military in the North that I concentrated on. It's an amazingly complex book. I wrote it with a chap with an atlas by my side, just to try and follow exactly where the explorers were, where Franklin went, where the dew line was, uh, where uh, the uh, Alaska Highway is. So if you do buy it, please get an um, uh, atlas right by your side. It's one of these things that is, well, it's an extremely complex book. So I thought... The, the book I'm writing right now is the history of Air Canada. That is a complex subject. That is an extremely Byzantine idea of political intrigue. Uh, I understand former Prime Minister Mulroney is in the building today, uh, so he'd be something to say about that. But um, it is much more complex than Arctic sovereignty. Um, Arctic Sovereignty began as a, actually began as a play. Uh, the whole thing was a, uh, a play with the background of the Arctic, and the characters would come on stage, whether they were in Royal Naval uniform in the 1820s, or whether dressed as GIs during the war, or part of what was called the Frozen Chosen, those Canadians who were in Ellesmere. They would say their lines, uh, talk about the vision of the Arctic, whether they were John Diefenbaker or uh, the present Prime Minister, and exit. And then my publisher said, well, a play isn't going to sell, put it into a book. And I did exactly that. It's a book in six chapters, and um, it's about the lands above the 60th uh, parallel in this country. In fact, it is actually 40% of this country is above that. It's almost half this country is the North. And my story is how Canada obtained sovereignty of that. And it starts from the Franklin expedition to the present day. As I said, I began writing books. Um, I began writing books when I was worked for the Department of Foreign Affairs. That place isn't exciting enough. I began writing books on aviation. I knew enough about aviation to turn out books, and I did one after the other. Uh, the Flying Canuck series was uh, very successful, and I uh, wrote uh, Wing Walkers, which is the history of um, Canadian Airlines. Now, some of you might remember Canadian Pacific Airlines. Canadian Airlines was the last stage in their existence. And it was just before they were merged with Air Canada, and I thought, well, being merged with Air Canada, all their files were going to disappear, rightly <coughs> so. So I made sure I wrote the history just before um, Canadian Airlines disappeared. Then in uh, 2007, I was in Afghanistan. I was embedded in Kandahar, and I wrote the book Canada and Afghanistan. Much of that book was written, um, I spent most, much of that time outside the hospital on the base, and I knew that's where the stories were. Uh, you always wait for the helicopters to come in. And that's, if a lot of helicopters came in, you knew there'd been a big battle somewhere. 
and um, uh, the last chapter of that book is about waiting for the helicopters to come in and whatever battle was taking place. And uh, the last day was there, uh, none of the helicopters came in. And I remember the chief surgeon saying it was all quiet on the Western Front. And that's the last line in the book. And it really is that. Um, it was um, quite something to... The book I wrote after that uh, was on Can Sailing Seven Seas, the Canadian Pacific Line. And Pat was very kind to arrange uh, uh, for me to come here. I managed to get a, um, managed to stow away, well, actually, no, I was the guest, uh, uh, one of those ships, a container ship crossing the Atlantic from Montreal to Antwerp. Fortunately, I was there with the very last British sea captain. All the captains now on that particular line are from India or into China or Chinese. And he was a mine of stories which appear in the book. It was fascinating. He, um, he wanted to show me what it was like to be in a lifeboat in the middle of the Atlantic. So he stopped the ship in the middle of the Atlantic, had the lifeboat lowered with 12 crew members and myself, and sort of took the ship away. I said, what could they do, fire him for that? Um, and it's the most frightening thing to be in a lifeboat. Lifeboats nowadays look like space capsules. They're completely you know, covered. But even then, you were in the dark, in the sea, um, and you could see the white of the ice far away. So I imagine what people in the Titanic must have thought in an open lifeboat like that. Um, it comes in. I still have nightmares, by the way. That. After that, uh, the book that... Um, it wasn't all bad. Uh, the year after that, I was in Buckingham Palace, and I wrote a book on the Queen's cars and trains and planes and the Royal Yacht Britannia. Uh, it was slightly different from Afghanistan and even more different from being at sea. Um, it was the book that I'm called about most often on CBC Radio, especially with the Royal Wedding when Will and Kate came to Canada. And this is the book the CBC wanted to talk to me about. It said, what about the royal cars? What's the significance to that? Well, the significance in the royal cars, and you can see that, is actually the hood ornaments on the Rolls Royces. Every member of the royal family has their own hood ornament. Her Majesty has St. George and the Dragon, belonged to her father. Um, the Queen Mother loved her racehorses, so she has had a horse on that. The... Um, it's interesting, Princess Diana had a little frog in her car, and that has been taken over by Kate, strangely enough. But it is tremendous significance in everything the royal family did in their cars, the color of their cars. And it was, it was a good book. It sold very well. Um, it's quite something. After that, I was in Sudan the year later, different from Buckingham Palace and pretty nasty. Uh, the machine I'm holding, the, the machine gun for, belonged to the Sudanese Air Force, and uh, we're using it to eviscerate the poor people in the, uh, in, in the cover of the book. In fact, the picture of those people standing in the village the day before they had been visited by the Sudanese Air Force. Canada was really, uh, people looked up to Canada so much, because as one of the Sudanese said, uh, you have no agenda. The British were colonialists, the French were colonialists, the Americans became the CIA, but the, the Canadians are here out of the goodness of their hearts. And I thought, yeah, that's quite right. It was quite something that they thought so much of in Canada. Finally, let's get to the story today. This is it. This is the North, as you can see. It was quite something to look at, and North is 60th parallel. The Picture this, in 1818, you have the Napoleonic Wars had ended. Uh, the huge Royal Navy that had been set up to defeat Napoleon was suddenly unemployed. He had 340 ships at the line, nothing to do. He had all those sailors suddenly unemployed, all those officers on half pay. If you're a fan of Jane Austen, you read any of her novels, there are always officers roaming around in full dress uniform and half pay. That was because, after Napoleonic Wars, they really had nothing to do. The Admiralty got the idea, but why not send them all off to find the Northwest Passage? This would be a discovery service, it would give them promotions, give them medals, things to do, and they could all go find it. Northwest Passage would be an easy way to get to India and China. Don't forget, the Suez Canal hadn't been built then, so getting through this way, 
after you figured out what the ice was going to be like, it would be a lot easier than going all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, all the way to India. So they were sent off to find the, an ice-free passage to get to India. Let me try and get this close by. Hope you can hear me back there. There are two ways, in fact, three ways, Dave, to get through. Um, King William Island, sorry, this is Victoria Island over here. You can go through one way or the other, or you can go around that. The trick was to make sure you did it while you could get through the very, very short Arctic summer. Once the ice came, you were dead. You were stuck in that ice until the whole winter. And don't forget, this was the time when it was pitch black. I was in the Arctic, I was in, sorry, Whitehorse um, two weeks ago, and it's still a very, very dark day and night. Imagine what it must have been for the sailors at that time, not knowing why. It would be 24 hours of darkness, absolutely freezing cold. There was nothing to eat, nowhere to get anything at all. It's a frightening time for that. Next slide, please. You recognize the gentleman there, that is Sir John Franklin up on top. The Franklin was sent, he was 58 years old at the time, he had had a lackluster career. As a young man, he had been a midshipman at the Battle of Copenhagen. He had actually stood watching Nelson defeat the French. He was a man who longed for some sort of political ambition to end his career with. 58 years old. This is the time the median age is 40, 45, so he's well past old age. There's something, if he could find the Northwest Passage, get through, he would be famous. And the Admiralty backed him for that reason. They gave him two ships, the Erebus and the Terror, with just two captains there. As you can see, uh, Fitzjames and Crozier. Young men also on the fast track. If they could become famous, they would one day go and become admirals themselves. They were the youth of the, of the Navy. Set out 1845 with two ships off to discover the Northwest Passage. Franklin was a technological man. He made sure that everything was absolutely the highest science could give them. The ships were steam-powered and had sails. The ships uh, made sure that he didn't have to rely on uh, <coughs> local food. He carried a lot of canned food with him. Canning had just come in there. Just been, canned food had just been invented. What had happened was food was boiled, put into these cans. Each can was handmade. And people didn't realize that, but to make the cans circular, you soldered them with lead filled with arsenic. You can imagine that. So you had ships full of food, the cans made out of literally arsenic. Also, to make sure that the uh, ships could push their way through ice, the, they were heavily reinforced. Both of them, the Terror and the Rebus, were gunships. They were built with heavy keels, huge sides, to fire cannon at fortresses. Uh, one of them, the Rebus, had been used in the War of 1812, uh, and it bombarded the American fort at Baltimore. So much so that one of the onlookers there penned a few words down and said, Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light? And it would become the American National Anthem. So it was a heavily strengthened ship, perfect to smash through the ice. It also had a steam engine. Uh, steam was just coming in into locomotives in England. But what the Navy did was grab two locomotives, put one engine each in each one of those ships, and sent them off not realizing that the boilers and the lo locomotives were used to ordinary water. Salt water would immediately gum up those boilers, but no one had any idea. So canned food, uh, boilers that would be gummed up, Franklin was sent out May 1845 out to find the Northwest Passage. A young man who lived quite close to where Franklin was leaving was an author, Charles Dickens. And he was trying to sell this book called Oliver Twist. No one was going to buy it. So he was, kept pushing this book. And he realized that there was a story here. The man who actually put all that food in those cans and pushed it off, of course, the Navy, being the Navy, went to the lowest bidder. They went to this man in Whitechapel who said, yes, I can sell you all the canned food very, very cheaply. Uh, take it all and 
Christian. Frank um, Dickens put that man called Fagin into his Oliver Twist, and as a result, he became quite famous for that. Well, it was going to be sorry, go, go back. <laughs> A three-year voyage, because once he went to the Northwest Passage, they have to go all circumnavigate the globe all the way back to London. So when no one heard from Franklin for a year, people thought, well, okay, he's making his way back. Two years passed, no one heard from him, it was fine. Third year, people were starting getting worried, where is he? Lady Franklin was quite a pushy person. She took a flat, an apartment, very close to Admiralty, where the Lords of the Admiralty used to meet, and every day knock at the door and say, is there any news, is there any news, what's happening? And she kept bombarding the Lords of the Admiralty, what's happening, what's happening there? And they didn't know. No one knew what happened to Franklin and the two ships. What we surmise happened is that they got stuck in the ice, their coal ran out, the ships were heated with coal, there were coal um, pipes, there was water pipes going through the whole ship. Uh, The coal ran out, and they froze to death, or they died of scurvy, or they died of poisoning. Eventually, what would happen is that they gave up, uh, they probably died of despair. They realized that there was no one was going to save them, and uh, the, uh, the young man, Crozier, uh, led them off in a death march to find if, across uh, the ice to find the nearest Hudson's Bay post. They never made it. They all died along the way, and you can see by the skulls there. Uh, they're still to be found, bits and pieces. For many years after, the Inuit would show up with spoons with Franklin's crest on that to sell them and barter them. They, the stories were that they had seen two white man's ships would gradually sink through the ice. Um, but by his death, Franklin changed the Arctic forever. The Admiralty immediately put out posters everywhere, £20,000 reward. This is the time when a vicar in Cornwall made £10 a year. £20,000 a reward to find those ships. Everyone jumped on board for that. Um, Ships went out immediately. They're all Navy ships. The American ships, uh, there were ships who went out to find the ships that were looking for Franklin. He had 50 ships sometimes out there looking for Franklin. No one could find him. It was a massive surge, pushed by Lady Franklin, pushed by the Admiralty. But in doing so, the Royal Navy mapped the area, took soundings, and by doing so, the Arctic was quite literally discovered in the same way. Here's a good shot of two of the ships on a later expedition. Now, Franklin did take a camera. It's one of the earliest cameras ever invented. Um, But, of course, the pictures he took would have disappeared with him. This is what it probably would have looked like. This is from the Nares expedition in 1870. It's being stuck in the ice for three years until finally the ship's disintegrating and people are leaving. So here you have Britain now having mapped all of the Arctic. Well, what do you want to do with it? The British really weren't crazy about the Arctic. There was no one there. There were no, they thought, no minerals. Um, you know, the Americans are more interested in the Arctic. But the British thought, well, you know, who should we give it to? The idea was, by then, the Suez Canal was going, it was China, it was India, it was Africa, all the riches were there. We should give the Arctic to someone. There was a school at the Foreign Office that thought, let's give, it, let's give it to the Americans. Let's give it to Washington. During the U.S. Civil War, Britain had sided with the Confederacy, wrongly. It was only with the, uh, when Abraham Lincoln made the um, Emancipation Proclamation freeing all the slaves that the British thought, well, we can't exactly side with people who own slaves. And as a result, the British thought, well, this would be a good idea if we give the Americans all of the Arctic. That would show that we are their friends. So, fortunately, someone thought, well, why not give it to this little country called Canada, or I should say this young country called Canada. 1870, Canada, if you've read Richard Gwynne's book and Sir John A. MacDonald, Canada was actually a very, very small country. It had one large city, Montreal. Toronto was a town. Uh, Kingston was a village. Ottawa was a village. Some people might say that hasn't changed. Uh, it really, there wasn't much in Canada at all. And suddenly, it was given huge amount, millions of acres, of, and no one knew exactly how much. That is the treaty that gives all of 
the north to Canada, just by those very lines right there. It says, all of it is now yours, Canada. Uh, September 1st, 1880 should be Arctic Day in this country. It was the biggest land transfer in history. All that land, it's actually 40% of this country was given to Canada, just like that. Um, you know, you can imagine when the cable came into uh, apartment buildings in Ottawa, um, Prime Minister Alexander Mackenzie was about, oh God, more land. <laughs> so all we need was more land in this country. We needed immigrants, we needed investment. What did we get? More land. Uh, so as a result, uh, the idea of the government was, let's ignore it until something actually, when we need to do something about that, and then we'll be forced to do it, and we'll take, into, take it into respect. What happened was that, excuse me, up in the Yukon, gold was discovered. Suddenly, and no one even knew, was it in the Yukon, was it in Alaska? There was no boundary at all. Um, suddenly, this gold came to being. Thousands of American prospectors who had come from California and Alaska flooded in. They didn't know they were in a foreign country. To them, it was just gold. It was just there. Um, they didn't know they were suddenly in part of Canada. To them, it was just you know, where the gold was. And as a result, it alarmed Canada considerably. All these foreigners coming into what is Canadian soil, um, you know, what should we do about that? There's not much they could do. They sent the gentleman at the far end, George Mercer Dawson, in 1887. If ever a Canadian should have a statue to him, it should be Dawson. As you can see, uh, he, but he suffered from Pott's disease, which is simply a Toulouse trek. He didn't grow any taller before, after he was 11 years old. He suffered from migraine headaches. He was extremely weak. Um, he had studied surveying um, in, under Robert Sparks, the man who uh, Sparks Street in Ottawa. Um, Sparks was a surveyor in Ottawa who, uh, besides surveying Ottawa, claimed all the best land for himself. Um, Dawson had studied surveying with that and had been sent by the Canadian government to uh, find the boundary between north, between on the 49th parallel from Lake of Woods all the way to the Rockies. After doing that, they sent him off to find to the boundary between Alaska and the Yukon. And he portaged, he rode, he walked all the way across there. Um, it, it finally killed him. His house is still today in Ottawa itself. Um, quite an amazing, amazing man. So much so that his colleagues named Dawson City after him. Um, it's quite an ex ex exception, gentlemen. One, one of the heroes. He was called the Little Giant for that. He was very, very tiny. Um, his father had been principal of McGill University. We've seen Dawson College there. It had come quite a distinguished place. 1896, gold is discovered. Americans are flooding in. Dawson warns Ottawa and says, I'm going to do something, claim some sort of sovereignty. This is part of Canada. His report is sent back to Ottawa, and in typical uh, government style, it is filed away and forgotten. But the Americans are flooding in. This is the Americans of the Chilkoot Pass, climbing up to the pass, looking for that gold, searching everything else for that. Um, there's no way to stop them. The only Canadian force out there is the Northwest Mounted Police, very few in number, and it's not like they have much control over the thousands of Americans. The Americans themselves couldn't understand why, up front to them, it was just wilderness. Canada had no claim to it at all. Uh, they couldn't understand why this was happening. The, you can see them climbing up to the, with the, with the uh, supplies that they had. Samuel Benfield Steele, Northwest Mounted Police. Had he been an American, there would have been movies about him today, like Davy Crockett. Had he been an American, he would have been a television program. There would have been statues. Steele, a wonderful name, Samuel Benfield Steele, Northwest Mounted Police, by his very... Uh, by his very stature, commanded, made sure that he enforced Canadian sovereignty, the tip of the Chilkoot Pass, uh, making sure that all the Americans made sure that they didn't bring their guns in, or the guns were not allowed to be used. Um, they were, Steele himself, uh, there's a wonderful quote in his diary, uh, Charlotte Gray did a great article on him. 
and uh, in one day's diary, and he said, uh, flogged all the whores and adulterers today in the village he was in. Yeah, that certainly made sure that uh, it was uh, something that um, you know, was, was carried out. This is a good shot of Dawson City at the height of the gold rush. Thousands of men. It went from 2,000 people to 28,000 in one year. It was the largest city west of Winnipeg. People packed in looking for gold, and as you'll see in the movie that I have, um, they didn't find much gold, because by then all the uh, claims had been staked. All the best places the gold was already taken. But once they were there, there was no food. Again, starvation, again, scurvy. People began dying of lack of all the game, all the animals were killed off. Uh, a young man, Jack London, um, would for the rest of his life, when he became famous an author, uh, suffer from scurvy. and has, uh, He had spots in his face. You see pictures of Jack London later on. He's always trying to hide his face. Uh, he wrote a book, Call of the Wild, about a dog called Buck. Story is that they ate Buck after that. <laughs> they, they were running out of food. Um, there just was nothing there for thousands of miners. The Americans in Washington said, let's send in relief, send in troops with food, feed all those miners there. That alarmed Ottawa. Sending in American troops to Canadian territory. What if they stayed? This was the time the Americans were fighting the Spanish in the American-Spanish War. The Americans were staying in the Philippines. They were staying in, um, in Cuba. Why, why wouldn't they stay in the Yukon? It really scared Ottawa that American troops, and all there was was the Northwest Mounted Police. Lawlessness was setting in um, as hard as the uh, Mounted Police tried. Things were falling apart. Enter Clifford Sifton. Sifton was the Member of Parliament for Ma uh, Manitoba. He had helped Prime Minister Laurie over the Manitoba school question, which is a very, very naughty thing to... Uh, the, the fact that you, the public pays for French language schools in Manitoba. He had helped Laurie with that, and to thank him, Laurie had made him Minister or Tsar of the Interior, which was thousands of square miles, anything that wasn't provincial territory, now was run by Sifton. Sifton realized that the only way to make it a Canadian part of Canada was to build a railroad. During the Falklands War, uh, someone asked Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, uh, how could Great Britain, a small island, lay claim to the Malvinas thousands of miles away in the South Pacific? You know, how, could, how could that be? One was there, one was the other. And she said, Nothing says sovereignty better than a nuclear submarine. Uh, uh, so, um, unfortunately, they didn't put that into the movie, which is unfortunate because that really was a good quote uh, from her. Sitton didn't have a nuclear submarine. Laurier didn't even have a Canadian army at the time. There was a Canadian military of three regiments, one in Toronto, one in Kingston, and the other in Montreal. Uh, but it was very, very small. I mean, the, at that time, the British were the ones who protected Canada. In fact, Laurier was wrestling with the naval bill at the time. Should they continue paying the Royal Navy to protect Canada or build their own navy? There wasn't much of a military force at all. Well, Laurier got together 171 men, made sure they all had good weapons. In fact, they had the new Lee Enfield rifles that the Rangers are still using today. Put them on a train, sent them up to the Yukon. Now, this sounds difficult enough today. We've seen Canadian troops in Afghanistan, in the Sudan, in Somalia. Uh, they have to be equipped, they have to be fed. Medicine, ammunition has to be sent up there. Back then, there was nothing in the Yukon, as you saw. There was no food at all. They had to live off the land. Uh, they didn't have the uniforms for that. Everything had to be put together to send the first Canadian troops on this expedition. And it was all done by Sir Percy Lake, who was the, uh, uh, the, the uh, logistics officer at the time. Made sure that they were all well equipped. They were sent off to make sure that the Canadians, uh, there was Arctic sovereignty at the time. Now if I could... My, uh, I have stolen this from my cat, so... Uh, um. <laughs> the problem was, how do you get the troops all the way to the Yukon when you've got to get through what is 
uh, American territory. Wrangell there is an American uh, army base. You could, the the um, Yukon Field Force took a Canadian Pacific ship up to Wrangell. Well, you can imagine the U.S. commander suddenly had a Canadian army getting off the ship, fully equipped with weapons. There could have been a war right there. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed, and all their guns were put into bond. <coughs> and the troops went on to the American border, and from there, they were given back their guns, and they went on to... Uh, they had to take a riverboat to Telegraph Creek, and from there, walk all the way overland until finally got to Keston Lake. It's a fascinating story in that the 100, sorry, 191 men also took four nurses with them, and they were from Toronto. Uh, someone over here, I think, we, it was a, uh, had given the story, but one of the nurses um, was also the first female reporter who went with them, a lady called Faith Fenton, who was part of the Globe and Mail, or those days the Globe. Uh, that was an assumed name. Being a female reporter then was considered so uh, low that she had to make sure her parents didn't know she was actually a reporter. But she went up with them, and it is her story that uh, much of this comes from. When they finally got to um, Tasman Lake, the Yukon Scows, these were flat bottom boats, were built for them by the Canadian Pacific, and they sailed up there. Um, they, they went up Five Finger Rapids, which is still today as dangerous as it looks, until they got to Fort Selkirk. Fort Selkirk was what Ottawa had in mind as the new capital of the Yukon. It didn't want to get involved in Dawson City. Too many Americans there, a lot of dance halls, a lot of drinking. Fort Selkirk was going to be as antiseptic as Ottawa was supposed to be. It was where the new gas center of the Yukon was. And that's where they were. They were there. They trained all, all the time uh, through the years. <coughs> Here they are with nothing to do. In fact, that's 1900. The troops are in their um, exercise clothes, training because they had nothing else to do. They, um, um, you, if you go in the hills behind, you can see that they used the hills for target practice. Um, at some times when uh, Dawson City burnt down twice to the ground, uh, people said it was because one dance hall girl threw a lantern at the other each time. It was also the fact that much of Dawson City had tons of dynamite. So when it burned, it just blew. Uh, the troops rushed over and helped put what they had out, and that was all the good that they did. By that time, the Americans had left. They'd already gone back to the States. The whole uh, sovereignty thing was dying down. But this was Canada's first time sending troops to protect Canadian sovereignty in that. You can see by the date, it's 1900. The Boer War is starting up. Britain wants Canadian troops involved in the Boer War. Immediately, Ottawa says, well, what are they doing up there? There's nothing. Send them out to the Boer War. So the troops are brought home. Some of them are sent out to the Boer War. Sam Steele would become a major in Lord Strathcona's horse and would do very well for himself. In fact, he would go on to the First World War. And they came home at the time. There was one conflict that didn't settle itself. And if I might come over here. This is the Alaska Panhandle, as you can see, it extends here the coast all the way down the line. Well, it would make sense that to give the whole thing to Canada, after all this is, after the British Columbia, you have the Yukon there, and Alaska's way up there. It used to be part of Russian Alaska, and in 1825, the Russians gave it to Great Britain. It was up to Great Britain to do what it wanted with it. Well, the United States thought, now that they bought Alaska in 1867, they would have claim to it. It all went to court. Um, a gentleman called Lord Alverston was the deciding judge to decide who was going to get this. There were three Canadians, three Americans, and he had the deciding vote for that. And this is what happened. The Americans were wanted what you see the blue line is. That was going to be it all. Everything, all the inlets would be part of that. The uh, Canadians wanted the brown line. As a result, you can see that there are a lot of the inlets. This is where river traffic is extremely important, so you need to outlet to the sea. The poor province of British Columbia wanted the green line, and most of that, all of that would be British Columbia. Lord Alverston decided, well, this is the time when Germany was coming up. 1903, Germany was becoming a major superpower in Europe. Who should 
Britain side with. Canada, well, Canada doesn't have a navy there. Hardly has an army. On the other hand, America, superpower coming up, why not side with them? And here is the treaty line where the brown line, the light brown line, is what it all is today. It is, it was, it shocked Canadians so much. In fact, in this very room itself, apparently there were discussions going on that Canada should take its own foreign policy in its own hands and decide from here on, Canada would have an embassy in Washington to deal with the Americans themselves. It was so, um, it was so shocking that here they had lost so much because the British had literally given away part of Canada at the time. The gentleman here was Captain Joseph Bernier. Um, he was a man who, um, for some reason, thought he was uh, Captain Canada. He was the uh, old sea captain, uh, decided that he should actually uh, claim Canadian sovereignty on the East Coast with no money. In fact, he, had, he made a tour around uh, Canada trying to raise enough money to buy a ship and go out, build, make sure, put, erect a flag, erect cairns around, claim parts of this for Canada. Um, the Laurier government finally bought him a ship, the CGS Arctic, and sent him around, and he would go around uh, the north, erecting these cairns, putting something, saying, this is part of Canada, erecting the flag, all by himself. Unfortunately, the Laurier government uh, lost the next election. Borden came in, and his ship was left to rot at, um, in, outside Quebec City, and he died in poverty. And good lesson not to, to make sure that you were on the right side. The First World War gave rise to two inventions. One was radio, and the other one was aircraft. Well, after the First World War, it was the Canadian military who built up uh, radio stations all the way across, and was, this is one of their radio stations. They would transmit messages from one point to the other, and they would charge money. So this was like the Internet, except that uh, um, it was run by the Army. Uh, they've got news. It was the only part of the Army that actually made any money. Uh, it was a commercial success. Uh, in, and then finally 1939 was taken over by Transport Department of Transport and now is part of the CN, uh, CPR. The Hudson Strait Expedition. What happened was you had Mackenzie King as Prime Minister. King needed to stay in power the votes from the uh, farmers out west. The farmers out west were united under a man called Charles Dunning, who was very vociferous and said, well, if we could ship our wheat from the port of Churchill to Europe through the Hudson Strait, rather than going all the way around through Port Arthur, uh, out to Montreal, paying tariffs along the way, it would save a lot of money. And King agreed he needed those votes. So as a result, in 1927, he sent the Canadian Air Force, this was the first time the Canadian Air Force would be involved in the Arctic, sent the Canadian Air Force to three bases there, and through the winter of 1927, 1927, if you are an aviator, is quite historic. This is the time Lindbergh had just crossed the Atlantic. In fact, not just crossed the Atlantic, Lindbergh had come to Ottawa on Dominion Day and flown his aircraft over Parliament buildings. And uh, King writes in his diary, here's a god descended from the skies to us. Uh, he was quite taken with Lindbergh flying. So this was amazing to send the Canadian Air Force out to the Arctic. And he sends, he makes sure he does that. These are the aircraft. There are Fokker Universals. Um, Fokker built good aircraft then, mainly because he had a young man working for him called Robert Nordian. Nordian would one day come to Canada and build the best bush planes ever at the time. These are the aircraft in Fort Burwell. In Port Burwell at the time, they were on pontoons. They would be on skis for the winter, and they kept flying up and down, taking photographs, uh, recording the ice levels to make sure that ships could be, would make their way through the ice. The first time the Canadian Air Force was used in that. Um, Second World War had quite an effect on the North. The United States feared that 
especially but even before Pearl Harbor, that the Japanese were going to take Alaska. The big American fear the Japanese were going to land in Alaska and as a result work their way down and it was an immense problem about that. Uh, Mackenzie King didn't think that was going to happen. King was more concerned about the war in Europe. That's where the Canadian troops were. There were no troops left, or very few troops left, in Canada at the time. The Americans kept pressing, build a highway from California all the way through to Alaska. That way they can supply Alaska with troops, with food, and reinforce it. King said, well, if you build a highway through Canada, at one point or another, you're going to, going to want to send troops to protect that highway. You're going to have American bases in Canada. Sovereignty would be an issue at the time. However, the, the highway was built, and so were the airfields. In order for the highway to be built, there were airfields built along the way. And that was quite important for Canada today. The other thing was the uh, Crimson Route. Aircraft were being ferried to Europe to fight the Germans, rather than taking them over by ship and being sunk by U-boats they were just flown over the Crimson Road was, they had airfields built for that and the planes would fly over again airfields built in Canada but they were built by the Americans for the US Air Force the Americans wanted their own people stationed there they flew the stars and stripes on Canadian so it was a touchy issue he had pictures like that, an American GI with a log cabin in the Yukon, and it says Broadway in Maine. It's now part of uh, Canada. It's now part of the United States. Um, if you ask the locals in the Arctic, what do they think of the Americans? They said, that's great. Um, I was in Whitehorse recently, and before the Americans came to Whitehorse, there was no sewage system. People took the sewage out of the river and the ice pushed, and threw all the sewage in. Now, the Americans put in a whole sewage system, they put in fire engines, they put in um, pipes, everything else. They really changed the north. You had um, you know, PXs, you had food. There was even uh, an illegal um, uh, distilleries going on. You know, would they leave? That was the big problem. King was finally persuaded to sign a treaty, and this is the Alaska Treaty in which uh, a road would be built through Canada and the Americans would provide uh, the money, provide the troops, provide the um, um, bulldozers to build the road. The gentleman on the left is the American ambassador, Pierpont Morgan. The gentleman on the right is Colonel Bigger, who is quite an interesting character. Um, I worked in the treaty section in Ottawa for many years. And he, there, wanted, there are two Canadian names on the Treaty of Versailles. There were two Canadians allowed to sign that. And he was one of them for some reason. Uh, I guess he was sort of like the treaty master at the time. King signed the treaty, but King also made sure that he was going to pay the Americans for every penny spent in this country. They weren't going to say, well, we did this for you, Let's, it's ours from now on, as would happen in Europe or the Philippines. He made sure that sovereignty was protected. And here's a picture of the Alaska Highway. As you see, very, very rough. Most of the troops that built the Alaska Highway, most of the American engineers were black. The white engineering regiments were in the Pacific or in Europe. Only the black regiments were left. And just to their credit, they had never seen snow in their lives, let alone freezing temperatures that they pushed through the Alaska Highway. Uh, the native Inuit had never seen what they called black white men. And it's quite strange uh, that they did this. The highway itself was always unpaved. And the stories of truck drivers driving through that um, were quite, quite interesting in the book. Well, the Japanese would decide that they were going to fight the battle a midway. Well, why not make sure that you do a diversionary action and uh, try and attack Alaska? They would attack the Alaskan islands of Kiska and Attu, land troops there. Uh, the Canadians were in Europe. There wasn't much of a Canadian Air Force there. King ensured, in fact, he took these aircraft, the squadron is actually from Rockcliffe Airport in Ottawa, sent them all the way to Alaska to make sure that they fought the Japanese. We are North Americans. Uh, the commander of this uh, squadron is Gordon McGregor, who would become the first president of Air Canada, by the way. Um, he ensured that the Canadian Air Force was involved in the defense of Alaska. Canadian troops landed in Kiska. Uh, by that time, the Japanese had already left the island. Uh, just, and apparently the Americans knew that. 
but uh, and 40 Canadians were killed in that uh, through friendly fire. Um, it, it was uh, what was called those days a snafu. You can understand what that meant. But the idea was that it was that sort of, for the first time. Well, the only Canadian ship that was in force in the north was the RCMP ship to St. Rock. Is the first Canadian ship to sail through the Northwest Passage from west to east. Amundsen had done that in, in 1903. But this little ship itself uh, was the only Canadian sovereignty Arctic patrol throughout the whole of the, of the Second World War. There was a tremendous fear the Germans' U-boats would land troops in the north, and the troops would somehow work their way down and blow up the locks. In fact, there's a movie about that uh, that's happening. Um, Sir Lawrence Olivier would play the U-boat captain, if you remember that movie at all. Um, yeah. But St. Rock was the only ship that Canada had in the north. But Canada was realizing that we have to do something in the north. So military exercises were staged in 1944. With three of them, muskox, polar bear, lemming. Um, Bombardier hadn't really started building snowmobiles at the time. So the Canadian military went, and this is an Ottawa story, went to the Ottawa tram car company and said, here's a contract, build us snowmobiles. And the Ottawa tram car company built these and sent them off on, uh, the tram car company closed on after that, uh, sent them off in the military. But it was the first time Canada was involved in the North. Uh, RCF, DC-3s dropped supplies along the way. Uh, Canadian troops realized that their guns would freeze. Uh, there was a whole series. They realized that you had to start defending the North because the new enemy was now further up there. Here we are. Three, uh, four places up there, way up there. How did we, why did we do that? It's because the Cold War was beginning. The United States feared the Russian bombers were going to come down. To make sure their own aircraft were on readiness alert, they kept flying uh, patrol planes. They kept flying weather planes, in fact, to get wind of the weather back and forth from Alaska all the way out to Thule Air Force Base. Well, wouldn't it be easier if there were permanent weather stations along there? They persuaded Canada to make sure that, yes, we put an alert and these other stations that Resolute would open up. The other, as you can see, this is the alert beginning. The other thing they discovered, in fact, this was Lester Pearson's idea, sovereignty means you have to have Canadians living up there. Well, no Canadian wants to live up there. Well, yeah, we can get some Canadians. And this is the time, this very sad time, they transferred Inuit up there and kept them up there uh, permanently because this was some sort of Canadian sovereignty. These were Canadians, although at that time they were not allowed to vote. Uh, and they were pushed out to Resolute. And they themselves didn't know for a very long time where they were. It was only when uh, I read books on aviation. It was only later on in the 1970s that, Air, that uh, First Air began flying up there and a lot of the Inuit were able to fly back home. It was one of the saddest tragedies in Canadian history wasn't one of the first times that transferring people to ensure sovereignty, the, the Danes had done this. Uh, they had transferred people from the European side of uh, Greenland to the other side to make sure that you realize Denmark owned Greenland. The Russians did it in Siberia all the time. But it was the first time Canada was involved in that. The distant early warning line, that changed the north forever. I've just put on the early ones there, the huge radar stations. Um, what had happened was that um, Prime Minister Diefenbaker really didn't know that this was going to take place. This had been decided with Louis Saint Laurent, who had conferred with um, President Eisenhower that a distant <coughs> warning line was going to be built. By the time Diefenbaker came to power, the line was already operating. He hadn't, could say nothing about it. There were American troops, American Air Force, operating up there. And uh, Diefenbaker was always shocked about that, that here we were giving away our sovereignty. Uh, this would be especially the case during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when um, he really didn't believe those U-2 photographs were of uh, Russian missiles in Cuba. Um, he thought they were pretty blurry pictures anyway. And it was only his minister that put the Canadian Air Force on DEFCON 1 that finally decided 
it went over his head. Um, Diefenbaker thought that the United States shouldn't run Canadian sovereignty. Um, he had a wonderful, there was a wonderful um, thing. He thought if you built roads to the Arctic, people would follow. He had a program called Roads to, to uh, Resources. You know, the roads, anything roads. Uh, the poor men who built those roads called it roads to divorces. <laughs> it was just the middle of nowhere, you were stuck there, all this time, nothing was happening. The uh, two big problems in the 1960s when Pierre Trudeau became Prime Minister was the tanker Manhattan. I'm sure many of you remember that, when the tanker Manhattan made its way through to Poudre Bay to get oil and come back. Uh, this was after the Torrey Canyon disaster in Cornwall. If you remember, uh, the Torrey Canyon was a tanker that uh, was wrecked off the coast of Cornwall, spread oil on the beaches. The fear was the tanker Manhattan, which was actually empty, would do the same once they started moving the oil from Prudhoe Bay down there. Um, there's another good story to that. Uh, it might be apocryphal for all I know, but uh, going through the Northwest Passage, the tanker was stopped by an Inuit chief, and they had to ask permission from him to continue on going through. Um, so who knows? The other problem was the, uh, the American bombers. Well, if you were going to hit the Soviet Union with their bomber, better to base it up there instead of basing it all the way down in Omaha. Or if you can't base the bomber way up there, why not the tankers, the, the aircraft that rise up there, refuel the planes. And those are, as if you know anything about aviation, those are turbo jets, extremely thirsty engines. Uh, you can see they already have their own tanks there, but they need to be refueled twice. Going to the Russians, coming back from the Russians. Well, if you based American tanking aircraft up there, they could do that. Uh, Canada had no choice in that. It was part of NORAD now. And the idea was to base those aircraft there. And they knew one day, inevitably, those aircraft, the American aircraft, would have nuclear weapons on board. And that was a tremendous fear that you know, we would have nuclear weapons in this country. This is the Canadian Air Force in um, the Arctic today. Little aircraft you see, the Havana Order, a twin order. Uh, there has four planes, in fact, the squadron, and the people there are the Canadian Rangers, who still use the Lee Enfield bolt action rifles, which they say are the best because they don't jam. And they are the ones responsible. Uh, I was with them last year. They fly over parts of the Arctic, drop the rangers out onto the sea ice themselves, and they are, uh, as the commanding officer said, we are the physical sovereignty of this country in the, in the Arctic. Um, there's a wonderful glacier that we flew over, and it's called the Hand of God. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it, but it, it's a glacier of a hand coming down the hill. And you can always tell, uh, you, have, you turn right when you do that because you're going to land there. But they call it the hand of God. And it looks exactly like that, the hand of God coming from the sky. But that's our, that's our Arctic sovereignty to this day. This is the dispute There's the, uh, between Canada and the United States of illegal ownership. To Canada, they are Canadian internal waters. To the United States, these are territorial waters. These are actually international waters where the United States should be allowed to send nuclear submarines or whatever they have through. Uh, why do the Americans feel like that? It's because of the Straits of Hormuz. It's because of the Singapore Straits, which are international waters. If the Iranians closed off the Straits of Hormuz, the Americans couldn't send their uh, navies for that. They feel Canada in the same way, that it should be international waters. Uh, this is a Canadian Coast Guard ship, and we feel it is part of our internal waters. This is part of inside of Canada. The other two um, problems we have are Hans Island and the Beaufort Sea. Hans Island is a tiny little speck of an island between Denmark, between the Danish Greenland and Canada. When I worked in the Department of Foreign Affairs, one day there was a tremendous flurry in that. The Canadian flagpole in Hans Island had fallen down. Would the Danes think of that as we were giving up our sovereignty? So people, a helicopter was rushed over there at great expense to erect the flagpole again. And it was quite a serious thing. This is part of Canada. Uh, the other one is the Beaufort Sea, and you can see a little part there. Um, 
be it's a part of the disputed zone. Why do we care about the Arctic? Why do we care if the North? This, this tells you why. It's a long way down through the Panama Canal all the way to Rotterdam. If, on the other hand, you cut through there, it's a lot easier to get to the China, to get to Europe. Who are the people building icebreakers today? The Chinese built four last year. Not for themselves, but to rent out to other powers. This is where it's, the Arctic is going to change at the time. Here's an idea I got from the Navy. What's going to happen? The sea ice in 2006, look at it there, changing there. There's still ice there. 2020, you have no sea ice or very little sea ice left. The routes now go through all the way. Finally, you have, it's open for traffic. The Northwest Passage is finally open, but Franklin and all those Royal Naval sailors way back then would decide the Northwest Passage is open to everyone at the time. In August 2011, Parks Canada organized a search to find the Erebus and Terra. As you see, that little boat actually goes up. It's quite a shallow area, so the, boat, the um, ships are not that far from the surface. Um, by the way, if you do go to England sometimes, go to London. Uh, not far from Trafalgar Square and Canada House, there's a little park called Waterloo Place. And there there's a statue of Franklin. And across the park is a statue of Scott of the Antarctic. Both of them were quite tragic figures in um, history exploration. And they stare at each other across the London traffic or every day, and you wonder what, you know, what they must be thinking about that. In their deaths, they elevated uh, exploration forever in that. Funny, I would say thank you so much for listening to me. For the web transcription service of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye and thank you for listening. Podcasts of other RCMI lectures in the 2012 season are also available on the website now, so please join us again soon.